Today we're in the second part of our series, The New Measuring Stick, a series where we're exploring what it might look like if we change the way of measuring our faith in Jesus and you know how we're maturing in our faith from behaviors and opinions more to how we love. And how could we measure love and allow love to be our new measuring stick? And you know, we used our handy dandy ruler last time and I know that this was kind of, uh, many of you were worried that I was gonna mess this up and do weird things with it. And you're right, I messed it up in person and that's, that's okay. But listen, as we look at this, we were reminded last week, very simply, that when we measure our love for others, which is what we went through last week, and if you missed that last week, jump on YouTube, feel free to watch those messages and we would love for you to catch up. But when it comes to loving others, we can't compare ourselves to each other and how we love, but we can only compare ourselves to the person of Jesus Christ and his love for us. And, you know, as I thought about that so much this week, looking at who Jesus is and his call to love other people, I thought, yes, this is awesome, but what about when life feels so full and loving people just gets hard? Have you felt like that at all? I don't know about you, but I know for me, this last season, um, honestly, it's been really the last couple of weeks, if anything, have felt abnormally full. Not full like, this is so great, I can't wait to keep going, satisfied full, but full almost in the, I cannot believe how much is going on around me, full. I'm not sure if it's because, you know, everything was canceled during the COVID season and it was totally fine and everyone was doing nothing. And now that things have opened up, everyone's doing everything. Or if it's just simply that school is coming to a close and there's all those events that go with it, or that as things are bubbling up, everyone's issues keep coming up. And, and so there's this constant, at least for me, tension of people looking for time or places that I have to go. And it just feels like every day, the list of things I have to do grows. D did you ever feel like that? I mean, it, it, throw it in the comments, give me an amen. You have felt that your, your to-do list just keeps growing on you. When this happens to me, I'll be honest with you, my list continues to grow. There are usually things that I begin to check off and push aside. And I'll be the first to confess to you that, that unfortunately, when I feel full of schedule, my time with God that I usually try to prioritize in the morning is one of the first things to go. And, and usually it's going because I stayed up on a call or I stayed up trying to catch up on something or getting to emails and I, I really want to get that sleep. And so I could skip on that time in the morning and usually I'll say something along the lines of, I'll make it up. And I look at my soap card and I'm like, I miss soaping, but I'll just do double next week or ne tomorrow. And let's be right, I, I never do double because then reading the Bible feels like a chore instead of a joy. Once that's gone and I find myself wrestling with not being with God, usually the time and the thing that goes in my schedule when it gets full is the time for me to recharge. That's when I'm not playing, you know, golf by myself, not taking a nap, not watching a movie or playing video games. The things that I like to do that bring me a lot of joy, I see those go out the window when my life gets full. And, and I tell myself in those moments, it's okay because I'll catch up on vacation. I'll catch up on that next Sabbath day. And the problem with that is in my desire to love others, like we talked about last week, I keep saying yes to this growing list of requests and hopes that are in front of me. And I keep saying, hang on to Jesus and to my soul. When this happens to me, loving people is no longer a joy. I no longer look like Jesus because I find myself getting frustrated at this ability to love and I, and I don't know what to do with it. And I'm saying, I don't have time for that. And when I don't have time for the people and I don't have time for God, I just, I, things get all, I can no longer love people and I'm left wondering what's left. And if we want to see our ability to love people on the horizontal, we have got to get things straight on the vertical. And today we're going to talk simply about if we really truly want to be loving people, then we need to know how to love God and love ourselves. That there has to be this looking up and looking into our lives or we will never be able to look out and care for others. 
Have you ever found yourself in those situations where you're surrounded by people you genuinely like? You've showed up to love people, but you can't stand the people who you're with right now. That you're frustrated that you're there and you can't even figure out why. If we step back for just a second, we're going to realize quickly that the people haven't changed. The need that they have hasn't changed, but the person who's showing up has. How can we love people if we have nothing left and we look nothing like Jesus? They're not getting the best love that Christ has to offer. They're getting the leftovers from everybody else because the to-do list has gotten too long. So what do we do when the commands and the desires and the lists get long? How do we boil that down to know what to focus in on, to love God and love ourselves? And I would simply say, the answer to that question was answered by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. He answered that very question from someone who asked him, how do I boil down all of this to something simple? And so if you have your Bibles with you today, I would love for you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, the biography of Jesus written by Mark, we're going to be in chapter 12 today. It'll be about three quarters of the way through your Bible. And as you're looking and, and turning to this, the setup to this is really, really important. In Mark chapter 11, we find this is Jesus's triumphal entry. This last week of his life where he shows up into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And, and if this is a weird story for you, like, well, that doesn't sound like very triumphal. I, I know but it's, it was said it was gonna happen a long time ago in the Old Testament, and now it's actually happening in, in this moment in Jerusalem during the Passover, in the celebration of Passover, which means the city has swelled with people. There's people everywhere. You're elbow to elbow all over. It's coronavirus nightmare type of, you know, packed in people. And now Jesus starts to roll in on this donkey and everyone in the city, all the Jewish people in the city are celebrating this Hosanna. They're laying down palm branches. They're putting their jackets down. Their king has come and they're celebrating this. And so what Jesus does is he gets off the donkey at the end of this procession and he goes over to the temple. And he kind of takes a look around the temple and then he leaves. He leaves the city and he goes away by himself for the night. He stays off site, if you will, and we know that he's frustrated because the very next day, he returns to the city. And in chapter 12, we see this moment where Jesus comes in and in the morning, he is so frustrated. He's so frustrated, and I, and I think it was because of his visit last night to the temple. He shows up in the morning, and he begins to take tables, and he just starts turning tables over, flipping things all over, and, and taking a whip and cracking it to, to move people out of the way to flip more tables. And the leaders of the temple, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, their priests who all work there, they're livid. And Jesus just keeps saying that you have turned this temple into a den of thieves instead of a place of prayer. You, you basically turn this into a place to rob people instead of love people. What have you done? The leaders royally ticked at him at this moment. And, and please understand, they've been listening to him for three years as he has taken everything that they said and turned it upside down, that he continues to say, I know what they say, but this is what God is really like. And now what they're about to do is pour all of their efforts into tripping Jesus up. And so the first thing they do is they try to trip him up without taking any responsibility. They try to trip him up by getting him caught in a tax issue. This week it came out, there was a bunch of tax issues for the wealthy in our country. And many people were like, how in the world did they get away with what they got away with? They're basically trying to get Jesus to tell all the Jewish people, you don't have to pay taxes so that the Romans would come in and arrest Jesus and do the dirty work for them. But Jesus comes back at them with this great little, you know, remark. And it leaves the goons that the Pharisees had sent in awe. And they're like, who is this guy? This is amazing. And Jesus then moves to a place where all the Pharisees and Sadducees, the city is swelling. They're all right there. They're so frustrated. And he tells a story. He tells a story about a man 
who owns a vineyard and rents it out to people. And when he rents it out to people, they grow everything and he goes to collect some of the harvest, which is rightfully his, and they continue to beat all of these messengers until finally they get the idea to kill the son. And in killing the son, they would inherit what's theirs. And Jesus ends the story by saying the owner is coming back and there's going to be wrath to pay. The Pharisees don't need a translation for this. They know that Jesus is talking directly to them, that he's saying, your head's on the platter. Jesus is clear. God is coming for you because of how you've treated this, and I know what you're going to do to me. They are ticked. And it goes from a place of frustration to a murderous intent. A murderous intent. So instead of the Romans, they try to rally the Jewish people to take him out. And again, in that same moment, surrounded by everybody, they try to get half of the Jewish people to follow Jesus so the other half will hate him by trying to divide them theologically. Jesus isn't going to have it. He goes through this debate and he's totally clear. And now there's a tension that is sitting around where everyone who comes at Jesus, he has these great remarks and they're all stuck in chapter 11 and 12 where he's flipped over tables. He's called out the Pharisees. These teachers of the law look like idiots in front of their own people who are celebrating this amazing guy. And there's one person I haven't told you about in this story yet. He's actually not even named and he hasn't been mentioned, but there's someone on the side. There's a man who's been watching from the very entry of Jesus on this donkey. He's, he's someone who is regular at the temple and he would have been around Jesus over and over and over because he's a teacher of the law. But this teacher has said nothing. He's done nothing. He's just watched. But the time has come where he must now ask something, try to get clarity. He's different than any other teacher or Pharisee that's come before him. And, and I kind of want to explore why he's so different together. So would you please with me turn to Mark chapter 12. We're going to be in verse 28 to see how he's not like the others. Mark 12, 28. One of the teachers of the religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now this doesn't sound like the other Pharisees, does it? This doesn't seem like he's out to get Jesus. I mean, when you look at what this guy does, it says that he's standing there listening to the debate. He's listening. He's trying to pick up on everything that's going on. And just to throw it back to last week, he's not distracted, is he? He's not sitting here live tweeting the debate between the Sadducees and Jesus. You know, he's, he's present listening. He wants to know what's going on. He doesn't sound like someone who's not open to change either, because he's about to say, I, I know there's a whole list of things that we agree upon as laws. Can you help me understand these greater? He's asking a question, which I would believe is one of the greatest things we could do to love others. This man is demonstrating what it means to love others by listening, paying attention, giving his full presence, not judging. And I love that when he listens to Jesus's answers, you know what he says to him? He says, you've answered this really well. Like, you, you're nailing this with these guys. He validates Jesus, not shames him or tries to push him aside or, you know, get him into trouble. What you're saying, Jesus, is spot on. I, I agree with these things that you were saying, but I could use some clarity. I can use some help. So the teacher takes care to take that great next step in loving people. And he asks, of all the commands, which is the most important? This is a huge question. I mean, how do you even begin to determine this? Um, there are so many laws in this Old Testament on this side, the Jewish side of our Bible, that when you look at this, there's, there's law after law. Next month, we're going to be jumping into Leviticus. You're going to see some of these laws and wonder, why in the world are these in here? Like, there's so many things. And we all know that laws aren't equal, right? 
We know that laws aren't equal in New Jersey. We like having laws against murder. We like having laws against theft. Some of us like laws against speed limits. You know, they're debatable. But in New Jersey, I would argue that we still have some laws that are on the books that are pretty weird. Did you know that in Haddon Township, just a half a mile up the road from where we are at the Classy Cow, it is illegal to annoy someone of the opposite sex in public. I know you're like, for real, is it? Absolutely, statute 175-12. Go look it up. You can't annoy someone of the opposite sex in public. Families, I don't know how you live in Haddon. It doesn't make sense. My kids would kill each other up there. Everybody would be in prison. Did you know that in New Jersey, it's illegal for a bird to poop on a statue? I, I think it's probably illegal for humans too, but that's not in the books. But how do you ticket a bird? How do they pay it? Did you know in New Jersey, it is illegal to slurp your soup in public? So for those of you who, Illegal, illegal. Did you know that in Newark, still to this day, it is illegal to buy ice cream after 6 p.m. without a doctor's note? I know you're like, what? Yeah, Mr. Softy, you're never making it in Newark. And this is still my favorite law on the books current to this day. I love this. It is illegal for a man to knit during fishing season. It's illegal for a man to knit during fishing season. To be honest, I, I, <laughs> maybe people were bored in the boat and they lost track of, I, I don't know how. I wonder how some of these laws came to be because there's always a reason, right? But I didn't know that these were laws until this week looking up going, New Jersey's super messed up, I get it. And I've lived in New Jersey most of my life. This man goes and asks Jesus, he says, listen, there's like a ton of laws that we've got to work off of. As a matter of fact, there's like 613 commands and laws in the Old Testament that these Jewish people would have to live by. And, and there's 365 negative laws. Don't do these, which is like one bad thing a day that we shouldn't be doing, right? There's enough to cover our year of things we shouldn't do. And then there's 248 positive laws, which is the do these. And what's cool about that number is most of the Jewish nation at that time believed that there was 248 parts that made up the entire human body. So there's something for every part of who you are to completely obey God that you can give to God, right? One command out of all of these things. What's the number one thing, Jesus? And he's not trying to trick him. He's not trying to play him. From one teacher to another, he's looking for wisdom. And in his new book, uh, Think Again, Adam Grant has a great, great saying, and it's simply this, good teachers introduce new thoughts, but great teachers introduce new ways of thinking. The greatest teacher, Jesus, is about to introduce this good teacher to a new way of thinking. Verse 29, let's go. Jesus replied, the most important command is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is the one and only Lord. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Now, if you've been around um, a church or a religious community, you've probably heard this said over and over and over. You've probably said it and had no idea where it was found in the biographies of Jesus and where he said it. It's Mark 12, it's right here. It's easy to read over this and move into what's next in the story of Jesus and go, oh, okay, he just goes to the next thing. I worry that we have lost what Jesus actually says to this man in this moment. Because we have a very curious teacher. Jesus isn't shaming him. He's summing something up for this man. And instead of snapping back at him, like he has with some other Pharisees, that moment like last week when Jesus looks you in the eye and sees you for you, I see him looking into the eyes of this teacher saying, I see you. 
your desire to learn, to grow. I gave that to you. Let me sum this up for you. Let me answer a question that's deep in your soul. And he starts with this phrase, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. Now, this is, um, this is a really cool way that Jesus is connecting to the greater community that's around him now. You and I don't quite get what he's doing here, so let me bring you into some Jewish culture. Jesus is saying the first line of what's called the Shema prayer, the Shema prayer. This is a prayer that every Jewish man, woman, and child would know because you spoke it in the morning, you spoke it in the evening. It's at every single festival, celebration, family gathering, Passover seders, um, whenever you were around other people, the Shema was being prayed together. They would pray it by themselves and they would pray it in community, but it was always spoken. And the first line, which Jesus just said, is always spoken and they cover their eyes. And it's like, what? They cover their eyes. They do it to get rid of all distractions. There's an intentionality that they're saying, I need to cover my eyes. And in English, we understand is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or the Lord is the only one. In Hebrew, and I may butcher this a little bit, it sounds, and I truly believe this is the way that Jesus would have said it, but in correct Hebrew pronunciation and tonalities, not there. I wonder if everybody around would have put their hands over their eyes out of habit when Jesus said, and he looked at them, covered his eyes and said, Shema Israel, Adonai, Elo, Heinu, Adonai, Echel. When everybody uncovered their eyes, what, what did they see? They were ready in a moment when this man asked for what's the greatest command. Jesus brings everyone from saying the curiosity that you have, the wisdom that you're seeking will first be found in prayer and worship. We will start at a place of prayer and worship of who God is because that's where all commands and knowledge will flow from. His teacher, this teacher was looking for knowledge and clarification. Jesus starts from a place of prayer and worship where all wisdom is gained and he jumps in to a new way of thinking about the greatest commandment. And the first thing he says is this, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. You know, verse 30 has become so familiar to all of us. It's become this passage that we just read right over, but for the Jewish people, remember that they had a law for almost every part of their body, 248 ways to obey God and to keep track of. And Jesus says, I, I have a new way of thinking for you because if you've got to think through 248 of what you need to do, you're going to be in trouble here. So here's what I want for you is to recognize that you're more than the sum of all of your body parts. I desire that you would love God with everything that you have, with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, with your strength. I want you to use everything that God has put at your disposal. Nothing is outside of this bubble. And if you have access to it, it should be used to love God with everything that you have. This one God that we all want to worship undistractedly. This is what I'm asking of you. This is the greatest command that I have for you. And I don't know about you, but when I look at the words coming out of Jesus Christ's mouth, I fall very short of this kind of love. And I'm confessing that to you because I, I fall short. My heart is more deceitful than I recognize. My soul is bruised and sometimes it's really hard to trust God for healing. My mind is overly distracted all the time. All these things. And my strength, it's always been weak. But even when I have it, I use it for me. I fall so short of taking this seriously, so it's easier for me to skip it and say, yeah, I know that. 
Instead of thinking about all that it involves, Jesus is saying that this is the priority of all the commands of what to do. Stop thinking about all the little things and give me everything. If you could think about it, I want it. Love me with that. I'll take it. Love me with everything that you have. And that's not the only number one. There's another number one. And if you're thinking, that doesn't make sense. You can't have two number ones. That's not the way it works. I would say you probably haven't read through the Bible because Jesus takes everything we think we know and turns it upside down. So here, we've got two number ones. And I'm going to hold to that because Jesus did. He said it. I'm sticking with it. The second is equally important. This means it's the same. Love the Lord your God with everything. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. Not only did Jesus meet this group where they are by speaking their language, praying their prayers, right? He expands the answer from, from you're looking for one, but I'm telling you it's bigger. It's, there's an answer that's more full than you're thinking. It is, we talked about loving others last week. And it's those last two words of love your neighbor as yourself that I think we need to kind of hone in on a little bit here. And, and I'm just going to say this up front because it just feels weird to say that I believe that God's called us to love ourselves simply because as a pastor, I'm always saying, you know, Jesus says, love others, serve others, be humble, put others before yourselves, all those things. And, and they're all true. But I also, I don't know. I look at what Jesus says and think, there is this call to love ourselves. And I can say that because I believe that you and I are loved, that we are loved by our creator, that you and I have been created in his image. And if the creator has created us in his image, and yes, he cares for us, we are called to care as image bearers of God for the body that he's given us. How do we worship God, mind, soul, body, strength, if all of those things are depleted and wiped out? We can't. And so this call to take care of ourselves is huge. How could we show up for people to give and to love them if we don't have anything left? We give God leftovers and people get what's fried. That's not loving anyone. And I think a lot of times we, we run at such a pace that we don't know how to stop and recharge. When you read the biographies of Jesus, you see all the time, he left groups of people to go be by himself, to take care of himself, to be with Jesus on a regular route, or to be with God, his father, on a regular routine basis. He went out fishing with the boys. He went on hikes through the mountains. He stopped and took days of rest because he's like, you know what? We just can't get there yet. Let's pause for a minute. He knew that time away for him was crucial because it allowed him to show up and to be present to love others. And there's nothing worse than someone who's burned out telling us we need to slow down. Do you ever have those moments where someone who's some section of their life is so dysfunctional and you're experiencing a little bit of that and they decide to come in and tell you how to live your life? It's so frustrating. There's no credibility to it. But too many of us, I believe, we try to love our neighbors by telling them about a Jesus who brings peace, forgiveness, love, joy, rest. And all our neighbors see is worry, anxiety, and stress because we can't get enough food on the table in time and kids can't go to bed. I'm worried that so many of us blow through our God-given boundaries and we prioritize the wrong things. We worship at the altars of activity and busyness. And we celebrate it and invite others into that worship, thinking, this is great. We say we care about ourselves, but I'm telling you, our fast food diets, credit card debts, and trail of broken relationships tell a very different story. None of that says care. We boast about surviving on four to five hours of sleep. How is that healthy? It's not. How can we expect to live and love like Jesus when none of our behaviors, attitudes, and lifestyle looks like Jesus? We can't show up when our priorities don't look like his priorities. When our pace doesn't look like his pace, we run at the pace of the world, not the pace of Jesus. 
We have to get this in control if we're going to truly love ourselves. We say we do, we don't. And when we don't love ourselves, we lose our ability to love God and love others. We can't. We have to learn to love ourselves by slowing down, being present to what God is doing in us. And, and Jesus says to this man, listen, no other commandment is greater than these. So he makes commandment, notice the singular, no other commandment is greater than these, the plural. Two have become one, loving God, loving others as yourself. And that word greater that's here, no commandment is greater. The, the, Hebrew, or the Greek word that's being used here is the word megas. And the word megas also has, uh, it's used in the word for megaphone, meaning bigger, and it's greater. It's used as a way to describe a loudness. How loud. And I love that because when I look at this, Jesus might as well be saying, is like, you know, when you love God, no commandment is louder to the world. No commandment is louder to the people watching and listening to the music of your story than this. If you truly want people to take notice of how you live life, then start by loving God with everything that you have. And love your neighbor as yourself. Start to set up a different standard. Your pace and your lifestyle, your priorities will look completely different than your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus. And if it doesn't look any different, which altar are you worshiping at? I, I don't want to live a life on mute because I have no capacity to turn up the volume. That my love feels dull, monotone. It's only coming out one speaker and it's a little shaky because I'm just too tired. This car has been beat up. We're not called to live this life. There's a greater, louder commandment for us. Instead of giving the answer that this curious teacher expected, Jesus teaches him a new way of thinking. A new way of thinking. What if it looked different, sir? And this man's response humbles me. I, I, I do kind of, when, I, when we read this in verse 32, I imagine him leaning into Jesus with these eyes wide open, receiving all that Jesus just said, and kind of thinking out loud to Jesus saying, the teacher of the religious law replied, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and the sacrifices required in the law. Did you see what the teacher just did here? Did you see what he did? He took what Jesus said to this whole crew and he turned it personal. I know it's important to love him with all my heart, all my understanding, all my strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. For the teacher, this isn't a theoretical thing anymore. It's not something I have an idea or might show up to talk about. This is a personal transformation that he's going under. His heart is being changed. A lot can happen when we move from theoretical to personal. And I believe there's so many of us that need to take the knowledge that we've all learned and bring it down to our hearts and say, this isn't just a good idea anymore. I will dedicate my life to the teachings that Jesus has here. And I'm telling you, I don't know how his contemporaries looked at this because he basically said all the sacrifices, all the offering, everything that we build our entire faith around this isn't even that important anymore. If it's not going to change my life and how I love God with everything and love people as myself, then what good is this? I, I, have, a, I have a feeling, a thought. This guy probably lost his job in the temple. This guy probably lost his teaching position because his life was transformed. And Jesus responds to him. And this is why I think it didn't matter to the guy. In verse 34, realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. 
And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. This could have been the most impactful, loving, and life-changing things this man had ever heard in his entire life. You are not far. This new way of thinking, actually taking Jesus' words and allow them to personally change his life, has Jesus looking at him and saying, my friend, my creation, your questions are amazing and you are taking steps and the kingdom of heaven is right there. The kingdom of God is so close. Like you're getting it, you're getting it. And I don't know about you, but that is all I wanna hear from Jesus. I dream of being in a place where he says, Jimmy, I know that you have a lot here, but each time it impacts here and it impacts how I love myself, others and him, I think, and I hope that he's saying, you're getting closer, you're getting closer. And maybe, just maybe on my deathbed, he'll say, you're still getting closer. And when he receives me in heaven, he'll say, welcome home. You are right here the whole time. If we're going to do this, we have to be able to measure how do we love God. And so like last week, I wanna give you two questions to measure how does your love for God look? And the first question I simply want you to ask is, how is my alone time with God? How is my alone time with God? This is not just about loving yourself to find your space, but this is about being present and finding time with your creator. This is about making sure that there's some moment where you can pause to be with the one who grants your every single breath that day, to say thank you, to sit in silence. Because a deeper love from God is simply going to come from prioritizing him and desiring him. I desire every day to go home, to be with my wife, for, for her to come home, to be with her. There's a desire that grows in my love, and there should be a desire that grows to want to be with Jesus, to sneak away at work when you're at the cubicle and you're frustrated at whoever's next to you saying, you need to take a bathroom break so you could go be with Jesus and say, I need a recharge with you. What's the desire look like? How's that prioritized? And please hear me, if you're always sitting here saying, yeah, I've prioritized Jimmy, I've, I've given God more time but I get nothing out of that. Like I, sometimes I just don't understand it. And I would say, that's okay, you don't need to. Because part of what being in a relationship is, is just showing up, showing up. And we show up for people, but I believe we need to just show up. And when God wants to speak, we are ready because one word from God will change our life. It did for this teacher. The other question I want you to ask in loving God is simply this, is God my priority? I want you to look at your schedule. Look at your schedule and think if someone looked at this, would they see God as a priority in how we use time? And I'm going to say it just because it's been on my heart for a while and I don't care how it kind of comes across right now, but it's awesome that we can be together here virtually right now and celebrate. But if this is, if you're with us today out of convenience and not necessity, you're doing the wrong thing. If you're with us for convenience out of necessity, for those of you who there's fear of the virus, there's um, health issues, or you are part of our you know, greater global virtual family, which I love, thank you for being with us. But if you are in the South Jersey area and you have a way to come be here at the Classic Cow with us in person, and you're choosing not to because you'd rather watch from your couch, I'm gonna ask you to stop to put on something other than pajama pants and show up if you can. Show up. If you can, you should, because there is nothing that can replace the communal gathering of the saints. And I know you're thinking, how does that help my measure of loving God? My faith is inspired so much more because over the pandemic, we didn't sing in my living room like we sing in this room. It's different. I like not being able to hear me, and, but to hear the, oh, the saints sing out their love for God, my faith is encouraged. And so I simply want to say, is God the priority in your schedule or is your convenience and busyness your altar? You probably hate that question, but I don't care. I hate it too, but it's important that we ask it. When it comes to loving ourselves, 
we've prioritized God and we need to look that Jesus had limits and boundaries. I'm not even gonna harp on that right now because we're doing a series for the next five weeks. We're gonna go over that. I'm not even gonna say anything about it now. But two good questions that you can ask for loving yourself is, do I know why I made that decision? And it's a weird question, but grab a journal, find yourself in a place where after you've made good decisions, bad decisions, I believe that self-awareness and self-insight is one of the most beautiful gifts from God. And, and we get to pray that prayer from David in like Psalm 139, where he says, you know, search me, O God, know my heart, test me, know my anxious thoughts and point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Take some time and ask God, to help you figure out why you make the decisions you make, why you snap at the people that you snap at, why when you could show up at a place that you're already frustrated at the people before anyone's ever done anything. God, what's going on in my life that's doing this right now? Sometimes journaling is, is great, but it's not enough. And I would encourage you, if you really wanna ask that question, do I know why I made that decision? Start some good counseling, especially after this pandemic stuff. Mental health is crashing everywhere. You need help, I need help. Go get it professional help that's going to help you discover who you are. Because when you know more of who you are, you can allow that love of God to saturate and embrace you so that you can love others. The second question that you can ask is simply this. When's the last time I had fun? We run from thing to thing, and I'm saying fun alone and fun with people. But when's the last time you had a, a like so much fun, you laughed so hard, you almost peed your pants a little bit, maybe you even did. When's the last time that, that you could say, we redeemed fun, silliness, laughter, and just enjoyed that day? Life's not so serious. You could breathe a little and have fun. We need to have more fun. This is why our staff Sabbaths for 24 hours is because we need to have fun. Work is exhausting. Step away from work, go have fun. Refuel, Jesus did this all the time. We need to find time to have fun. If you're thinking, I can't get 24 hours, schedule two. I don't know how you have fun. If you have to say, I'm gonna have fun for two hours, there's probably different issues. Start with a counselor, then go have fun. We need to do this together because I truly dream of being a church that when we pause and we want to measure a new, we want to have a new measuring stick of our maturity, that we look at the cross of Jesus and say, am I truly loving God? Am I truly loving myself and loving others? And the cross becomes a symbol of love for everything. And when we dedicate our lives to this, we hear the words of Jesus in Mark 12, 34, that he says, you, Crossbridge, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Let's keep taking steps towards the kingdom and loving people, loving God, loving ourselves and serving those who are around us. Crossbridge, I love you. I love celebrating with you. And I love that God has given us the gift of love. Would you go live this out for the sake of Jesus yourself? and your neighbor. God bless.